Hello, my friends. Welcome to Word Made Digital. I'm your host, Joanna LaFleur, and you're watching the YouTube version of the podcast. Week after week, we're coming at you with conversations with creatives and communicators all about how to communicate the best news in the world but in the digital age. Thanks so much for watching, checking out this episode. If you want to know more, you want to check out more of our free resources, go to wordmadedigital.com or browse around this YouTube channel and you're definitely going to find some content that will help you. And of course, thank you so much to our sponsors, Compassion Canada and Wycliffe College are making this podcast possible. Enjoy the interview. Alejandro, welcome to Word Made Digital. I'm glad to get you on the podcast today. Super pumped to be here with your crew. And uh, man, I'm excited to, to chat with you today. Hey, can you, before we go too far, can you give us a little intro on you? And then I'm going to try and unravel it a little bit because <laughs> there's a cool story behind it. But tell us like where you're at now and a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I'll give you the Reader's Digest version. I'll try. In 1999, I dropped out of college, I had three classes, went to college for two weeks, dropped out to go to Bible school. In the business world, I don't say that. I just say, hey, I dropped out of college because um, it sounds cooler. But I, I ended up dropping out of college to do ministry. <clears throat> and uh, at, at this time, I read a book um, called, either, it's, I think it's The Path to Success or The Road to Success by Bill Gates. It said, by, by the year 2010, half of every dollar will be spent online. It's that's this 20 plus years later, and it's still etched into the back of my mind. I just knew that the web was where I wanted to be. Digital is what I wanted to learn. And um, I, I also knew shortly after that, that full-time vocational behind the pulpit ministry wasn't my thing. And um, <clears throat> so I struggled for, for a few years. Um, you know, I did ministry, but I just did not want to didn't want to become a pastor and got married in 2005 and kind of got my stuff together. <clears throat> and uh, I started learning about search engine optimization. And, uh, you know, in 2006, I was able to use SEO as a side project. I worked two weeks in January, two weeks in um, September and made a little over $125,000. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, this is it. Like I can quit and I'm, I'm going to be rich now. <clears throat> and, uh, I was not rich. I, I struggled after that, but, but I, I continue to learn about SEO blogging. We were calling, we were calling social media before social media. It was called web 2.0. And, um, we would use web 2.0 properties to social media sites to rank in the search engine. So I was kind of cutting edge when it comes to SEO. And then buddy of mine said, Hey man, like, you know, SEO takes forever. You can actually turn on traffic to your website with paid advertising. And so in 2010, I really started getting into advertising online, Google, um, Facebook ads started happening. And in 2012, I decided to sell my business, my agency for my wife to go to nursing school. So we had two kids, we did it backwards. And she, uh, we, we went to nursing school when she was, um, uh, I think, late twenties, late twenties. So we, we kind of did it like the long route, the, the, the one, the route I don't recommend my kids doing. So, um, so I sold the business and moved to Seattle. And shortly after that, I got recruited by a company called push pay and they gave me a bunch of money and I started to advertise and in two years built the digital strategy to, and we went to a hundred million dollars. I was like employee 20 something. And by the time I left, it was like 400 employees. And around that time, um, I did not want to start another agency. I just did not want to start another agency. And in, this, in one week, um, John A. Cuff, Carrie Newhoff, and and Brady Sharir reached out the same week, all asking for help because they heard about the push pay story. And long story short, started an agency, Did have been doing the agency for the last three and a half years. Last October, my pastor kind of twisted my arm to make me become the executive pastor. So I manage kind of the business side of our church and, um, and I, I raised two, two girls with my, my beautiful wife, Sarah. So, so that's kind of the 20 year of, man, a lot of people do a lot of different things. I always wanted to do marketing and I always try to learn it. And I sucked at it for a very long time. Uh, and then I, and then I finally got good at it and I'm trying to get even better at it. Now, 
with marketing, because I sort of my own story comes out of I started in I did business. I, I kind of came out of a business background, mm -hmm. tech marketing. I, I worked in high tech yeah. companies. I, mean, I did other stuff, but primarily was in the high tech industry. And uh, I felt really that God kind of said, uh, you're supposed to use these skills to serve the church, these same marketing PR comm skills, but do it for church. So you've loved marketing, but what was it about church? Cause you could do, I mean, these skills, you can apply these anywhere. Why are you doing church stuff? Yeah, <clears throat> that's great. Um, almost actually all of my clients now serve the church at some level. Um, uh, I do some consulting with people that aren't, don't serve the church space, but, um, I feel like I've always been a hundred percent business and a hundred percent ministry. Um, you know, my pulpit is, is, I don't know. I just, I, there's something, I think my calling in life is there's, is to find people, um, and extract stories from them and be able to help them create more impact. Um, that's why I love working with the people that we, we love because, you know, we can, you know, uh, we can really scale the masses. We can really, um, reach millions of people. And so, uh, and so. I love the local church because they're, and I love growing the local church. A lot of people say, oh, God grows the church. Oh, okay, semantics. But there are eternal consequences, life or death, if we don't grow the church. Like, that's actually a healthy and a good thing to want to see people come to Jesus, right? And so, so I actually love church growth. When I started using that word in 2015 with push pay, man, a lot of people didn't like it. Oh, Holy Spirit, well, just preach better, preach the Bible. And I'm like, that yeah. makes sense. But man, like there, again, there are eternal consequences. There's a level of urgency that we have to have in order. Uh, I, I just have that, that weight on me. I, I love having that pressure on me to want to grow the local church because I think there's nothing better for the world, especially right now, than the local church's potential fully realized. So, yes, 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 yes. Uh, okay, like cool. Lots I wasn't of, sure. Lots I wasn't sure. <laughs> but like lots of churches are not growing. Um, so what are growing churches doing that the shrinking churches don't do in this moment? I mean, of course, there are there are probably a thousand different angles we can talk about from, you know, financially to spiritually to, you know, there's, there's lots of ways, but from your expertise area, what are growing churches doing that shrinking churches don't do? No. And, and that's fine. There's a lot of, there's a lot of variable but from where I sit and I look and I work with small churches, large churches, the thing that got you, my, my, we have a church of about 10 years old and a little over a thousand people. And because of COVID, we don't, we not that, we don't meet regularly. Right. Um, but, but my pastor for, for at year seven, he was treating his church like it was a startup still, but it was like six, 700 people. So one thing I told him was like, the thing that got you here is not the thing that's going to get you there. When we got to 10 million at push pay, the thing that got us to 10 million wasn't the same thing that got us to a hundred million. So we had to have a new level of thinking. I, I think it's the difference between uh, a know-it-all and a learn-it-all. A know-it-all is like, well, we've been doing it this way. We've been always doing it this way. And I, I, you know, I've got the plan from God and this is what we're going to do. Where a learn-it-all goes, man, like we can learn from people like Joanna and this podcast and Carrie's podcast, and we can read books about how to do this. there's there's organizations and networks to teach us how to. So I think it's I think it's a posture from the lead pastor's seat where he goes. And, and, and I know the people that are listening to this right now are those forward thinking churches. But I also think sometimes there's a little bit of tension about about um about growing, about using these new ideas and new technologies, Joanna, you and I, you know, we, we, we live and breathe this, but people yeah. are know that they need to, they listen maybe in private and it's still, there's an internal tension that they wrestle with to really go all in, um, on digital. We're not saying leave physical, but man, there's so much that you could do. And so for me, I, I think churches that are growing are thinking digital. I think they're, they're thinking, um, about the future, not just, with how they've always done it. Well, we got to 200 really quick. We've got, and they've stayed 200 for five to 10 years. And so, so I think there's a lot of variables, but I, I think it's a posture and a humility to understand you don't know it all 
and that you want to learn from others. And that's why I think those that are listening to this, they do want to grow because they're listening to a podcast to learn how to grow those things. Yeah. Well, and it's what you're saying in some ways too, the, the idea of learning the know-it-all versus learn it all. I love that. I love that idea. Um, it's a growth mindset that's starting with you. Like it's not about the, it's not even organizationally at first. It's just like, I want to grow. I don't know everything. And then that will pour out into the church. I mean, why do you think, <laughs> I mean, maybe it's not as true now. Maybe it's less true now than it's been in the past. If I want to be optimistic, but why is it that churches, uh, uh, they, they act like know-it-all? Like, where's the, where, where does that come from? You know, we're supposed to be these humble people. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to be honest, from? and it's not everybody. Like, because I'm in the business world, man, we, we, we Christians can look so silly. Like, you would think if you looked at Facebook the last three months, you would have thought that Jesus – lived in Kentucky and was from the South of, you know, like he was born in the United States, had blonde hair, blue eyes. Like you would think that, right? And so there's this Western thought in churches, man. And, and, um, you're Canadian. So you, you have a, you have a pass. Um, but, but there's what this Western thought, man, that, man, we, I think it's, I think it's, I think we've been accustomed to always winning in America and I mm. think, I, I think that, um, it's this, just posture of like, and it's of, of being better than it's almost a, like a Pharisee type of, um, culture or, uh, and this, I didn't even think we we're going to talk about this and I don't think about this often. That's why I don't have these answers, but I just think it's like, we get this weird posture, a lot of churches, get this weird posture. It's like, I'm just going to preach the Bible. And it's, it's all insecurity. You know, it, it's all insecure. And I think it's just like, man, we just preach the Bible and I do what God says and the Holy Spirit's going to lead us and everything's going to be okay. But man, that, that has, that is not, it doesn't work. And maybe in small town, Elizabeth 10, Tennessee, where my friend lives with a town of 200 people, maybe that works there. But if you are a church that is focused on outreach there are real problems happening in, in America and, and throughout the world, but real problems of people that have faces and names and it's really messy and, and it's hard to navigate. Like, how can you, how can you be for, for women and how can you also be for the unborn child? Like, these are things that churches are dealing with right now. Yeah. And yes, digital, we, we advertise, we market all that stuff, but it's just, it's a funky place. And I don't know why we're even talking about this right now, but it's such a funky time, Joanna. Yeah, with, I know. It, well, it's, it, I mean, in some way what we're saying, uh, you know, one of the things I say over and over here is, um, we're made digital is so the church has the best news in the world. So we should be the best, the, news. The best community, not just good news, the best, we should be the best communicators in the world because we have the best or the, you know, could say the most important thing to say. And, and when I say that, you know, I, I, I don't say that to come across in, um, when I say the best news, I don't, I hope that doesn't come as like an arrogant swagger kind of thing. It comes as like, Oh, actually like, look at Jesus. Like, isn't he the best news you've ever heard when you really get to who he is? But then we have all this church crap on top of it. And now we market it. Like it's the, it just sounds like the worst thing ever that nobody wants to be part of. And then we're, and then this marketing campaign, if we're talking about yeah. marketing is trying to get people from the church down the road to come to our church. It's just like trading players as opposed to it's actually transient like, you yeah, know, traffic. Like, it's like some church fast growing church. Well, everybody left that those three churches and went to that church. Yeah. But yeah. it is, it is, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating time right now um, in the church and using things like digital communicate better. And, and again, there's so many different dom belief systems on growth and there's churches that are Bible churches, like read verse, verse by word by word. Then you got churches that are a little bit more outreach driven. And, and, and so, so I, I'm more along those lines and those, um, and the reason I talk about some of those social issues and things um, and I don't really care deeply about a lot of that stuff. I, you'll never see me post about that stuff on social media, but 
the reason I bring that up is if you're an outreach driven church, these are questions that come up. They're, yeah. they're very real questions that come up, you know, homosexuality, um, you know, uh, marriage and, 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 and pro-life, pro-choice, uh, you know, social issues and all these kind of things. We're half, and I live in a town of 250,000 people, um, traditionally very conservative, but there's a lot of like these younger millennials that um, watch a lot of media. They are on native to social media. I grew up when Nintendo came and so I kind of grew up with it. Um, but this has been in their hands since they were one years old. And, and so, so, so for me, like, these are things that churches have to deal with. And I don't think churches really wanted to deal with it. When I first started Bible school, when I met a lot of people at Bible school, for some reason, they, they wanted to argue with other Christians about like their faith. And they, they, because they're learning something new, they had this like arrogance about it. And you see a lot of people that get saved and go gung ho. And it's like, how come you're not preaching more and posting on your social media more? And I think if you, if you do not have the self-awareness to, to, to that, you are coming across a little bit arrogant, then, man, I think you're going to be in trouble moving forward with digital. It's just very, I don't know. Yeah. And this is, and this is stuff I'm dealing with right now at our church. I'm also the executive pastor I mentioned earlier at my church. So these are real things that I think a lot of churches are dealing with. And um, I love that we're talking about it because I don't hear a lot of church podcasts talking about these things and how to communicate that best news um, in a way that is inclusive, uh, not e exclusive in a way that, makes us seem that we're not against things, but we're for people and we want to see people win. And so um, this is kind of therapy for me. Now, I'm, I'm thinking of, I'm going to get to the question in a sec, but uh, there's scripture that talks about you're the salt of the earth, you're the flavor, mm. but what can salt mm. do if it loses its saltiness? Like it's nothing is to be thrown, you know, trampled by, by horses or whatever. I'm butchering my paraphrase no, of this no, idea, yep. but the salt of the earth. Uh, I've heard an interpretation of this, that that is actually, cause we, of course we lose so much when it translates to English in 2020 from, you know, 2000 years ago in a, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a Middle Eastern culture, but it was something yeah. actually that Jesus was speaking apparently to self-awareness. There's something about the, mm. the idea of salt and being self-aware um, that we're the salt of the earth. And if we, if we lose our saltiness or we lose this self something about self-awareness or an idea of how we present ourselves in the world then like what good are we <laughs> and so all to say i'm thinking about this you know there's and we use salty lots of different ways like as a cultural expression yeah. these days but um when you go to a client what would be some ways because how do we know we don't know what we don't know it's hard to see our own blinders it's why people would bring in a consultant or would bring in someone outside sometimes they are able to say stuff or see stuff that people can't see or say so how how do you go about that like you go into an organization uh or to you know a, a leader and they are there are always going to be areas they're not self-aware how do you do that? How do you assess that? <laughs> Here's what I will say. The, the most, so I, I, I work with um, like influencers in this church space, um, people leading and moving the church forward in certain parts of the church. And it's fascinating because the more, the more influential someone is that I, the more open-minded that they are. And I actually believe that to be true in business, mm -hmm. the more influential, um, with a level of humility, the, the more influential that someone is, um, usually I found that they're more open-minded and humble and open to new ideas. Huh. The funny thing is the people that it's the opposite is also true. The most stubborn people are, are, are that I talk to have the most toxic cultures. It's fascinating. And we're just mm -hmm. being really honest here. And so I always, first thing I ever do is I've taken audit of an organization and um, they're paying me. And, and even before we work together, I set the expectations that, Hey, I'm going to talk about some really, I may talk about some really hard things, but before we even, you send me any money, I don't want your money unless 
you know that I'm going to ask really tough questions. I'm going to challenge you um, because your goal, you told me you wanted to impact these people here. You wanted to grow this here. You wanted to do this. Yeah. And in order to do this, you got to be open to a different, like your blind spots. And so, so I always, even if I, I didn't like something that you did, I would always ask you, instead of just telling you, I'd say, hey, Joanna, can I get your permission to talk to you about X, Y, Z? And if you said no, I wouldn't talk to you about it. But if you said, yeah, ab absolutely. Well, that's great because I want to make sure that I got your permission to speak into you on this. And I think that, you know, Seth Godin was right in his best book ever was permission based marketing. Mm -hmm. And, and so anytime I'm working with an organization, I'm always, I'm always setting the expectation beforehand. Um, and, and, and it's that radical candor. I don't remember who wrote that book, but, um, you know, it talks about challenging, um, challenging directly and, um, challenge directly and care personally. A lot of people care so much about them that they don't challenge them. And then he sweep things under the rug and this person runs rampant and no awareness. And we've seen that happen in leaders, but then on the flip side, you have people that challenge people and, 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 you know, um, but don't really care. And it comes across very destructive versus, um, uh, constructive. And so, so when I, when I see with someone say, Hey, you know, I notice that your team, you may not want to hear this, but your team doesn't have a lot of margin. It's as a result of you running this organization, like you were a startup again, or it was just you and two people or what, whatever. And so you may have margin, but your team based on your last minute planning, it just, and so, so all that to say, when I'm, I'm, I'm working with an organization, it's always um, setting the posture of humility up front and, and the, getting the permission to, if I'm going to do my job well, I have to be able to ask you really hard questions and I have to be able to push back on stuff because I'm going to advocate, advocate for you. And by advocating for you, leader, I'm actually going to be advocating for your employees and your team and your community. And so when I'm on board with someone, I am doing my best to almost be like their fiduciary and making sure that I'm doing what's best for them. I don't care if they don't like me for a moment or if they're, we do this, but for some reason it still works. And I've got clients that have been with me for years and they are okay with me doing this with them because it's kind of like sandpaper. You, you, it doesn't feel good at first, but you, you smooth it over. And again, go back to, man, the most influential people I work with are the most open mind, open minded people. Hmm. And when you say open minded, you probably don't mean specifically like theologic, maybe you do mean theologically open minded or something, but maybe you mean more about like open to change or open to hearing feedback or what, like, what are they, what are they open to? I was to? thinking, I was thinking to change initially, but you know, as you know, theology drives philosophy and sometimes f philosophical stuff comes up. Um, but for the most part, I'm talking, um, I'm talking more changing direction, new ideas. Yeah. Um, you probably, and there's certain things where it's like, um, you know, there's this kid friend of mine who, um, when I'm with him, he's the most kind I'm for you type person, but a lot of his posts on social media seem very combative, very political, very, and it's not the way he treats me and how I feel with him in person. So I said, Hey man, I care about your influence online. And when we're together, you, you encourage me, you lift me up, you tell me what you're for and how, you know, but when you're online, it's, it's different. And so I said, you know, I, I just told him, you, you may lose your influence with a lot of people by always trying to talk about what you're against. And so, so sometimes there is some theological, philosophical type stuff, but, uh, but for me, it's, it's more in the organization. It's kind of my role at the church too, making yeah. sure that people have margin and, and uh, you know, we're planning and all that good stuff. Yeah. So I'd like to take a little bit of a, maybe we could, could you take us to school a little bit? Because I think a lot of what you do, as you said, you've spent 20 years learning this. We can't begin to, you know, we're scratching the surface, but talk to us a little bit about, I, I want to talk about email marketing specifically. I don't know if I've talked enough about it on this, but um, why email lists matter. And then you talked about permission-based marketing. So I think the classic thing is like the person who over emails and annoys people. 
um, and asks them to buy stuff way too often and, you know, all this kind of, so talk to us a little bit about what is email marketing? How does it work best? Um, when it doesn't work, you know, I'm going to leave that wide open, but take us to school a little yeah. bit on this email marketing stuff. So I got actually got my start in email in 2001 and we were sending spam. I didn't know it was spam at the time until the can spam law came out, but we were sending millions of emails a day to people that weren't asking for email and it can spam law came out in 04 or five that got shut down. And, and emails always had a special place in my heart because, um, if you look at, I, I just give one quick stat in 2008, um, Obama he raised $690 million from email. It outperformed every single paid advertising social. It outperformed everything. And today, that's 10, 12 years ago today, in my clients, myself, stats will tell you, email always outperforms. And so people may, well, then why are we doing social media? Well, you use social media to communicate and you, it's, it's, you, you do social media and email and video all for different purposes, but they all need to be cohesive at a level. So we use email to, or excuse me, social media, especially paid ads to grow our email lists because email like, a, like podcasts are very intimate. It's very one-on-one. -on -one. And so, um, so email is, if you want to sell something and getting, uh, or getting a, a important message across or invite people to Easter or Christmas, Email will do the best for you nine out of 10 times. And so, you know, to your point about, you know, people over emailing or just asking for stuff, there are certain people that email me once every few months and if I don't like it, I'll unsubscribe. But there are people that I'm actually subscribed to that I read their emails every single day. They send me a daily email. Mm. And you probably know this as a writer. It's like, how long does a blog post have to be? as long as you need to get your point across. And if you can get your point across and, and add value to people, send email. Carrie Newhoff, a client of mine, he actually, um, he sends, and you're just with him, uh, he sends, before, last year or two years ago, about a year and a half ago, he was sending one or two emails a week. And then we bumped it up to four emails a week. And his open rates went up. No, before you did that, up. how did he feel? Just yes. before you tell us the result, how did he feel when you are revising him, send more emails? <laughs> well, he was start, he was seeing people, he was seeing people do this. Like, he, here's the thing. We used to email for Carrie every single, when we did a launch of a product, we would send emails every day. And sometimes I would like, hey, can we send two emails? And Carrie's most important thing with his audience, and I love this about him, is trust. He never wants to, and he was so he did not like selling. And so I said, when done right, selling feels like serving, you're serving and you're selling. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by selling is all selling is, is getting someone to buy into your idea. So if you send an email to promote Christmas, you're technically selling. If you're sending an email telling people that they need to add a service, you're selling them on that idea. Um, but when it's always asking for something that benefits you and that's all your emails are all about, well, then you're losing. So most of Carrie's emails are content driven. A lot of times he'll do a promo in the PS. Um, so, so, so Carrie was reluctant at first until the data showed him that the more he sends, the unsubscribes go down, the opens go up, the clicks go up. And, uh, mm -hmm. but, but at first Carrie's, you know, you know, he, cause he cares so deeply about his relationship with his audience and you that are watching, you have a relationship with your audience, your congregation, or maybe you're an author or a speaker, you have a relationship and those people need to hear from you. It's probably one of the worst things that I'm at. I tell other, my clients, it's so easy for me to tell them to send more email and make them value driven. And then every once in a while, send a promotion. Um, but I have an email list of almost 10,000 people, a little over 10,000 people, and I don't email them enough. And so I feel kind of bad promoting email, but for our clients, um, in our church, when we send more email that is value driven, 
That's conversation. That's not, hey guys, how are you? That's, hey, hope you're doing well. And in making it sound like a one-on-one -on -one conversation, email can do so, so great for your ministry or your organization. And so when you're saying value-driven, you mean something like give them something that's of value to them, but not for, not a paid thing. So, uh, you know, a great blog post or a podcast or a video clip or an article, or that's what you mean by value. Yeah. I think of it like, um, it, it, it's, it's not just a tip. It's not just inspiration. It's not just a promo, but it's also this idea of thought leadership. Mm -hmm. Now, when I mean by thought leadership, it's just like a leader has a thought and, you know, I had this idea today, um, called and and I have all these and I should write them down but I have all these thought leadership posts posts and one about being petty because um there was a situation that came up with our church where it's really easy to become petty and what I said to my pastor is like we got to take the high road on this we want to be petty but and it's like that's a post right there those ideas those thoughts Kind of like your use your email sometimes, and I don't see a lot of people doing this in the church, Joanna, is um is just shared with your list your thoughts. Man, I was watching I was watching the um the Olympics the other day, and Michael Phelps won his da 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 da, and I thought it was fascinating because he did this, and that's just like those are that's thought leadership. It's not a tactical or practical three steps to grow your business. Sometimes if you just communicate and talk to people, I think that you will start to weed out people. Your open rates will start to go up, but people will start to see the multifacets of who you are. And so, um, and, and it's funny because more of my business clients do this type as opposed to, you know, some of the churches that we work with or, or ministry type organizations. But, um, but does that make sense? Like, like yeah. just, just thoughts. Like it doesn't have to be practical and tactical all the time. It definitely doesn't always have to be promotional, but just ideas of what you're thinking about because they are on your email list. They've given you permission and they actually want your thoughts about random things. And when I think that email does better than social media, it starts to build a level of trust and bond and loyalty. And if you do that over a consistent amount of time, it, it really builds like just the connection so deep with you and your community. So the classic question is how do you grow the list? Uh, I mean, it's what everybody, how do you grow your Instagram account? How do you get more subscribers on YouTube? I mean, the classic question, um, you know, if people are, they got the only people on their email list is like all their best friends and their mom and you know i don't know two other people who felt bad and gave them their email so where where do people go <laughs> if they're i mean when you get 10,000 there's wrong some person because my mom does not subscribe <laughs> to my email list gosh yeah. dang it um you know it, there's a couple ways to do it the classic the classic way is hey come up with a pdf an ebook and all that stuff. I actually recommend to just put together a checklist um, or a cheat sheet. So like, you know, I've spent millions of dollars in ads on Facebook. So maybe I have a Facebook ad cheat sheet or an Instagram growth cheat sheet or a top restaurants in my city cheat sheet or checklist or guide or something. And that's the classic way you can promote that. You could put a little bit of ad money behind to promote that thing. But if I was, uh, it, 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 well, it's actually what I teach. Um, I would recommend um, driving people to a Facebook group. And one of the questions that people that you, when you start a Facebook group, and for those that don't know this Facebook groups, um, uh, the organic reach is a lot better than like a Facebook page right now. And it's better than a group. And it's better than a, um, your personal profile. Facebook's actually investing heavily into groups. So I think churches should have them. I think organizations should have them. Um, but you can actually ask some questions when people join your group. And there's two questions that I always love to ask. Um, the first question is when it comes to X, Y, Z, when it comes to growing your faith, when it comes to growing your business, when it comes to growing your email list, what is your biggest question or what is your biggest obstacle? Because this allows me to now come up with some sort of 
content um, repository idea, you know, uh, that, that I can then create videos and emails based on what they struggle with. Yeah, they're, the telling, thing, they're telling you what they want help with, then you can create something that adds that value to them. <laughs> you Joanna, can then the, help the them biggest with it. Problem, <laughs> the biggest problem with all creators, pastors, preachers, influencers, thought leaders, is they're saying, they're, re they're saying what they think their audience needs to hear, but great thought leaders, influencers that are having massive in impact um, is when they had 20 people, they actually knew the felt need. They knew the pain that that, all, then it grew to a hundred, then it grew to 10,000 and starts to do this because they actually asked the question versus like, oh man, I know it's, it's, the, it's the learn it all versus know it all. The learn it all is like, man, I want to know what, what's the bleeding neck, you know, like what is the biggest pain point? Like not the pain point that they're going to face in 10 years, but the, the thing that you can point to right now, what's the problem that they have right now? Um, but that second question on the Facebook group is, what is your email address? We'd love to send you weekly updates or, hey, we, we'd like to give you a free checklist. So enter your email. And the good thing about Facebook groups is if you get it right and put content in there, um, it starts getting re recommended to other people and people will just start to find that, um, find that group. So, um, you know, again, Facebook groups, paid advertising are probably the best ways to grow an email address. And if this is a business person that's watching this, you will make more money per subscriber on your email list than you will your likes and followers. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have the data in front of me, but that's the data that's always one. And, and, and I don't know why if it's because email is like one of the earliest channels since the 90s or 80s. But man, it's still one of the best ones. And I think people, they're like, oh, well, open rates are 20%. Open rates are 30%. Well, if you post on your Facebook page, about 1% of people will see that. Yeah. If you post on your Instagram, well, you you may get 1% to 3% engagement on that. And so 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 I love, I love email and I'm glad we're talking about it because it's so powerful. Um, here's, here's a question. Is it better for the email to come? Maybe it depends. Is it better for the email to come from the a person's name or the name of the company? Person's name, one hundred percent. Again, it, it it doesn't feel personal, but you have to make it personal. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, and and so I mean, word made digital, word made flesh. There's nothing more personal than talking about flesh. Like there's something <laughs> human, there's something, there's flesh. And we say digital, but like, man, if we, we have that same context, like it's almost like the word made human, the word made real in digital format. Like to me, it's gotta feel, there's gotta be soul. There's gotta be like a heartbeat behind it. And you know, when you're just, you know, new vintage church, eh, but when my pastor signs it, we get more opens and it feels more connected. I try to do away with images, you know, images actually hurt your deliverability. So just make it look like an email from friend to friend. Mm -hmm. You know, when you send an email when I send, you sent me an email, it didn't have all these cool images and like, here's what I'm doing. And PS, here's all the links you can buy. Like, no, it is actually just a personal email. And I think churches and organizations should really consider stripping all that stuff away, maybe a header, but just test it and try and treat your email like you're talking to one person. Um, and that's maybe a story for another time, but personas and really understanding who your one perfect ideal person is and, and just speak to that person. When I'm actually looking at my camera, you're right here, but when I'm looking at my camera, I know who I'm, I know who I'm talking to know exactly who I'm talking to. And so, um, and, and, and that's why you see the passions. Why? Because it's, it's word made flesh. It's like, Oh, it's human. It's yeah. soul. It's oh, And so, and so that's where you, you, I, the long answer to an email from, it should be personal. Now, I mean, you're, um, maybe, maybe I'm answering my own question, but you are really a teacher. I can hear it in how you're answering these questions. You love sharing this stuff, but oh, like you have a few, a few other things going on. And now you've opened up this, like you're doing teaching, like people can sign up with courses with you. I'm thinking about doing one of these myself. I have a lot to learn from you. I do want to be a student, a lifelong learner, and I have a lot to learn. And so why are you doing that though? I mean, you have, 
a few, like you've got a lot else going on. Why did you, why are you choosing to offer this kind of training to people right now? Yeah. You tired of people like me asking you all the time? (laughs) Well, I remember when I started my agency in Sacramento, it was 2007, 2008, it was an SEO agency. And I I started doing with these events. You'll always see that everything I do is tied to an event. I think I would have been a the world's best youth pastor. I still think I should be one, but um, just events. I love events. You look at the greatest companies in the world, Apple. What do they do? Hey, we got an Apple event coming up and they build so much anticipation and excitement for an event. Tesla, throw a this boulder marble thing at the cyber truck. It breaks, it goes viral. They sell two, they pre-sell 200,000. So I'm, I'm very event driven. I I think churches should be more, look at a great movie, a great movie. Star Wars starts promoting a year in advance and different things and collaborations and partnerships. But they, what they don't do is they don't on a Friday say, Oh, Hey, today, come watch the movie. They don't do, they build excitement. And so when I used to host events in Sacramento, um, used to host these tweet ups, no one wanted to, no one wanted to let us in. And Panera Bread, we smelled like bread by the end of the night. They let us do it, put 64 people. And we built that up to where we were at penthouses and, you know, lounges and 300 people will show up. And what happened, what ended up happening was people like, hey, I'd love to buy you lunch. I'd love to buy you coffee. And I'm going, this is awesome. Like I'm getting free lunches and free coffees and I don't ever have to pay for lunch again. Until I realized like, man, I think my brain is a little bit better and more valuable than $15 hamburger. And the second most more important thing was the people I would give free advice to, they would never do anything. They would never do anything. And, and, and I, I don't remember a lot of people that took my free advice and ran with it. There huh. were some that did, but people that pay, pay attention. People that pay pay attention. When you have a good giver at your church, it's someone that's probably invested. What does the Bible say in paraphrase and butchering like you butchered earlier, you said, but um, <laughs> it's uh, where, the, where your treasure is, there's your heart or something of that sort. Yeah. And so wherever your investment is, whenever your attention is like, that's where your heart is as well. And, and if you just like, Hey, I, I got this one guy I know that just, Hey, I, I got a quick question for you. It's like, I, okay, okay, let's talk. And never takes advice. And so I started creating courses for the sole purpose. I understand that transformation happens when you invest into yourself, you pay attention to things. And I've spent nine grand over the last three months in investing into myself and courses and coaching. And so, so that's the only reason it's not even for me because I probably should charge a lot more to be honest with you. Um, but, but I wanted to do it because I feel like my greatest calling in this season right now is to help people kind of discover, extract, um, the messages and stories and passions and purposes inside and help them get it out to the world so that, um, it's like, it's like you, like, man, I want to help you get this podcast to so many people because that's the superpower that I have is helping take people's ideas and spreading them to the masses. And so that's why we started offering these different ways. And I don't have it all figured out of how I'm going to do it and everything, but I will tell you, I'm a consultant. I'm, I, I've got an agency. Those are two separate things. I'm an executive pastor and I'm a dad, but I only work Monday through Thursday, nine to three. And I take Friday off for the most part. And why? Because um, I'm just a rigorous planner um, and I've learned through trial and error on how to plan, plan well. So, so that's why I create all these weird courses. And I know in the church world, it kind of became really popular over the last two, three years. It's like, oh, why are these people selling and all these different things and charging? And, and um, it, it may feel weird, but man, investing yourself just goes a long way. The last thing I will say on it, we invest forty to sixty thousand dollars from a university, and more often than not, people don't go into that field. And so, so or if they do, you ten years later, 
it's not still like you need more training. <laughs> it, you need more training, continuing yeah. education. Yeah. And so, so my thing is like, man, you know, we have to equate this digital, you know, this digital, uh, e-learning, which is a $325 million a day industry. We have to treat it like it's university. We have to treat it like it's that same education. And if we did, we treated the same way that we should have treated university. Um, I think people will, will grow. And I think that's the new way it's supposed to be a billion dollar a day industry by the year 2025. So that's where stuff's headed. Um, we are, and last thing on that, our church, our connect class, we're actually moving it to a course model. And, um, instead of an in-person kind of four week connect class, we're moving it to an online course model to speed people through the process, to get them to an event. And so, um, so I think the course model, getting people and, and pe by the way, people don't have to pay for our connect class. That's actually a good idea. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> but anyways, that's why I teach. I, I love teaching. I don't thank you for saying, I don't think I'm a great teacher. I think someone like a Kenny Jang, if you know, Kenny, oh, I think yeah. Kenny's a phenomenal teacher, just, just brainiac. I want to get him on this Me, podcast because we talk oh, all the time behind the scenes. Kenny would do it. Yeah. But uh, I haven't it. had him um, on yet. But for me, I just, I've got one to two things I'm world-class at, and that's all I do. And that's all I talk about. And because I've talked about it for so long, I've gotten decent at it. And so thank you for the kind words. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I guess uh, I'll, I probably just only have, I mean, I have so many more questions, which is probably why I'm saying, you know, I, I've been recognizing in myself where are the places when I look into the new year, uh, where, where am I investing in my own growth and learning and mm -hmm. why you keep coming to the surface over and over. There's lots of options for myself. So again, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on is because I'm following what you're doing and trying to learn from it. Thank and you. I hope that others uh, listening can find you now and follow along because we have a lot to learn <laughs> and I'm in this world too, but there's, there's so much to learn. And, um, I guess, you know, you, you're working with leaders, you're working with churches, you're in the local church yourself, you know, as, a as a last question, I think I'm just really asking like, what are you hopeful for? What are you, what are you, there, there's been so much hard stuff. There's been so much discouraging stuff. There's been so many big leaders who've had public crash and burns lately. I mean, lately and every year, uh, but what are you hopeful for? What are you excited about when you think of the future of the church coming out of this COVID scenario? Um, what, what would be your encouragement today for people listening? Yeah, I think uh, if Biden wins, the church is going to grow. I think if Trump wins, <laughs> the church is going to grow because we still have, you know, it's all kind of weird over here right now. Um, if we go to war, the church is going to grow. If COVID gets crazier, the church will grow. Like God is going to grow his church. And I think it's up to us, the hands and feet to have the awareness, the salt, the awareness to go, man, I'm just not going to sit back, but I'm actually going to be pro proactive and aggressive and urgent. Um, when people start thinking, um, I always think of a single mother of three and, 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 and it's because every woman in my life, um, was single, you know, my, my, my great grandmother, my grandma, my aunt, my cousin, Denise, her mom, my mom, like everyone was single growing up. And if we care less about our egos, if we care less about vanity metrics, if we care less about the numbers and care so much about that one person that you have the greatest news of all time, that if that person gets a hold of that, it can change the trajectory of their life, of her life and her kids' futures forever. Yeah. It creates a new urgency. And I see so many people in this communication space that it's, it's, and, 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 and I'm probably judging a little here, just to be honest. Um, but it's all about kind of us and the cool things that we're up to, as opposed to how do we, how do we get into people's 
lives and their hearts and their minds in a deep, deep way. And that's the thing I'm hopeful for those people that go, you know what? That makes sense. I don't have to know all the marketing, but if I actually give a crap about people like, and it just burns inside and they get a hold of God in their life, their lives will never be the same again. And so to me, I'm hopeful that there are people out there like that, that care that deeply about that one person, um, because there's a lot, there's a lot of that one person out there. And so that drives me, it drives me at my church. It drives me in business. It drives everything that I do, um, because people need the, the best hope, the best story of all time, um, because it's, it's changed my life. And so, um, man, my encouragement, encouragement would be, um, to look at your life and I look at my life the last 20, 30 years and seeing God's hand in every stage, every season, every heartache and go, man, I, I want to always, I always want to have that in the back of my mind so that I don't slip up and think I'm too cool for school. Because the moment that you start thinking you're too cool for school and you have all these great things, then man, you, you're, you're going to leave, you're going to lose a lot of your saltiness, your effectiveness. Um, so I just, I just, um, I just encourage everyone to just remember the goodness and grace that God has had on your life. Um, and, and ask him daily to give you that urgency and that burning desire to see people's lives transform. After that, man, it's easy to do everything, but until you really, oh, oh. People can't see what I'm doing if they're <laughs> listening to this, but um, just Angst. the urgency, man. Yeah. And I, I get fired of that. I got fired up about that stuff. Yeah, that's so good. Okay, Alejandro, where do you where do you want to send people to find you? Uh, find find learning from you. Do you want to throw them to your YouTube? You, we didn't even talk about that, but your family has oh, a man. YouTube channel. <laughs> we have a YouTube channel. We're doing a Walmart program. We got a, my daughters are toy ambassadors with Walmart. It's insane. Um, yeah, my Instagram and Facebook, uh, profiles, probably the best ways to connect. Um, Facebook owns Instagram. So it's fascinating. I'm saying that, but yeah, connect with me. I'd love to send me a message and let me know you listen. And, um, if any of this resonated with you, uh, I'd love to, to connect with you guys. So thanks for having me. Ah, it's great to, to hear from you. And I love hearing your, your heart and your passion. I, I, that's where I said, like, I love that we went to some places you weren't expecting. Cause I think that's where we're going to get more of, uh, your heart and like why you do what you do. So thanks so much for hanging out with us today. Thank you.